Hi, I'm Gaby McGuire, and you're watching Sound Stage Country. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest this evening is a true gentleman of country music. Born in Kilbegan, County Westmeath, with a career spanning over 30 years, singer, songwriter, guitarist, please welcome to Soundstage Country, tonight's guest, John Hogan. John, after 30 years in the business, I have to say you're looking fit and healthy. How do you maintain that good lifestyle? Gibby, it's good to be with you. Thank you. It really Thank is. You. I'm delighted to be on the show tonight. Yeah. Well, the fit and healthy bit now, I don't know about. But anyway, I, I, in my youth, uh, and that's not today or yesterday now, <laughs> I was a marathon runner and... Uh, Probably, I was a member of Tullamore Harriers. I'm probably the one of the worst runners they ever had. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I maintained a certain level of fitness. You know, I always say to people that, um, you know, you, you have car insurance and you have house insurance, you have all sorts of, but the best insurance you can take out on, on yourself, and it's, it's not a given or it's not a guarantee that you're going to get through, but is to look after your body, you know, from a, health, from a, a, a healthy point of view. Uh, do a little bit of exercise. You don't have to strangle yourself or kill yourself. I do a bit of swimming and do a bit of walking. And, uh, Good man. You know, yeah, well, it's, that's, it's, that's where it I'm shows. at with that. It shows. That's where I'm at. Yeah. I don't know about shows, but <laughs> I, I, I love it. I love being out in the air, and I love that, that yeah. part of life. Well, know. now I'm going to take you back to the early days, and you didn't venture into the music until the, your 30s. Uh, what, what went before that? Well, you know, I was uh, I'm one of a family of nine, you know, and the same as most families at that time. We're all big families, you yeah. know. And gr growing up in Kilbegan, Growing up in Quebec, and was a, it was uh, at the end of you know I was born in 1953, so you can do your calculations. You know what age I am. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, growing up at that time, I came in uh, to the world as it were at the end of a great era. I thought you know when um, things were very simple, and you know I've always modelled my life <clears throat> right through on simplicity. The word simplicity itself, but. It was a great time to be around. Great music. Yeah, great music. There was always the Ramlin House. There was always little stories being told. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just thought life was wonderful at that time. I really did, you know. And then when you were of an age, the thing to do was, you know, you got a trade. Yeah. Trade, you had to have a trade, you know. And, uh, and the one place I didn't want to be was in school. Okay. So the first trade I could get, the you first went. one I could get to take me, and I was neither interested in carpentry or block lane or anything else but there was a guy called Paddy Gurry in Kilbegan and he was in a garage and he says I'll take you on so that's where I ended up as a as a mechanic and I progressed into to fitting and one thing and another okay. and uh, so and then the next big thing you had to do in your life when you got your time served was to get married okay and that that followed on as well so no harm. And, and then uh, you know again I, I had a family and a house and and so I was, you know, working with Bordnemona then, you okay. know, working with Bordnemona. And I had a family of five, and I was working as a fitter with Bordnemona. It was a brilliant job to have. I remember when I got the job at Bordnemona, you think you would have to get in the lotto. Good. Get a job for life, you know. It's just so different than the way it is now. You know, everybody there at that time, great uh, people to work with. I worked with the best of people in Bordnemona. And, uh, you know, I remember... You, you were delighted, so delighted to have the job, but you needed it. Yeah. With five children and a mortgage and all the rest, certainly needed it, and certainly I was glad to have it. You and know. was there music in the background then at this time? It was always music in my house. It was always music, you know, in, when I was growing up, the Ramlin house mm -hmm. at home. Yeah. There was always people. My mum played an accordion, oh. and, and subsequently people rambled in, and there'd be a session, as it were. Okay. be singing singing songs and at that time telling ghost stories and all sorts of yarns and it was great it was absolutely brilliant you know um, and that's where my music would have came from now my, on my mom's side um, all of her family were very very musical as well uh -huh. not so much my dad but my dad did sing okay. and he said that to me in <clears throat> later years of his life he said you know your mother's not the only one to sing I'm able to sing as well, he said, you know. A quiet, modest and man then. Quiet man, yeah. quiet man, yeah. But he did sing for me and I had it on tape, lost it, and I would give the world to have it today. And did you yeah. join in at this time? Were you part of the... No, I was only a gossip. And yeah. I remember I was only a gossip at that time. And, uh, you know, my mother used to work in the, in the, in the, in the chapel and anything that could be done to earn a few bob extra. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, no, I, I didn't... Um, she used to take me down, be in bed at that time, be very young girl. And when she'd take me out of bed to come down and sing a song. Okay. And I'd come down and uh, sing Red River Valley. 
That was the song I used Gene to sing. Gene Autry. <laughs> sing yeah. me little party piece. Yeah. And then get out to bed, you know, that sort of way. Yeah. But uh, I remember I used to have to ring, I used to have to close the chapel at night. Okay. I used to have to close the chapel and I'd never forget it. And I remember one particular night that we were, the Ramlet house was in full swing and my mother didn't tell me to go back to bed, you see, but <clears throat> I was supposed to lock the chapel at six o'clock in the evening, okay. on a winter's evening, you know, and I forgot it. And I remember um, they, they start telling ghost stories and I was in behind the turf box <laughs> and they were telling these ghost stories. And, and the more they told the ghost stories, the further I went under the box. The less you were coming Until out. my mother <laughs> caught me on, in that she says to me, did you lock the chapel? And I said, no. Well, get up that road, she said, and lock that chapel. And don't turn on a light. Yeah. She says, the parish priest will see it and I'd be run. And I said, someone will have to come get up that road on your own and lock. And I remember at that time on the Tullamore Road in Kilbegan, there was very little light. And I started up the road with the... And the ghost story still <laughs> And ringing. the ghost story. And the further, and the faster I ran, the more ghosts were after me. <laughs> I never forget it. And I fell over the, the, the rails and everything, trying to close the chapel in the dark. Yeah. But those were times. But there was music everywhere at that time, you know. But to come back to how I became, you know, later on in life, how yeah. I became... I was a fitter, as I say, and five children. And board in Mona, at that time, you'd always be looking for a bit of overtime because it was the extra, to get the extra, to get something Just for another, confirmation, another to bit, get yeah. something for whatever. Yeah. But um, they, cut out, they cut out overtime. I was in a bad way then. I said, what are we going to do, you know? And We're I thought then it was the emergence of the pirate radio stations at oh, that yeah, time. Yeah. And that's not today or yesterday no. now. And there was... Um, I remember the first time I heard the pirate radio station playing country music all night. Right. You wouldn't hear it like on RTE at the time, you know. Uh -huh. But um, it was a guy called Don Allen. They used to call him Daffy Don Allen. That's who he, how he was known in um, Radio Caroline oh, back yes, in the yeah. 60s. He yeah. was on that boat that was a ship that was yes. out in the... They were trying to... They were pirates at the time as well. But um, he was playing country music all the time. <clears throat> and I had a radio at work. And I used to listen to it when I was supposed to be working as well, you know. Yeah. But anyway, <clears throat> so I decided to, to call him uh, to see would I get a job with a small band. Mm -hmm. Earn a few bob at the weekend or wearing a few bob that was going to be massively important, you know. Mm -hmm. And I rang him and he answered the phone right enough and I said to him, would you put out a little request to see does anyone want a singer, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Nobody wanted a singer. And I rang him back several, several nights, but... Never, nobody ever wanted Nothing to sing Nothing came of that. Nothing came of that. But it went from there then I decided to, I'd have to, if I, you know, if you wanted to be a singer and you were advertising yourself to be a singer, you had to show them that you were a singer. Put yourself you out there, yeah. Put yourself out there, you know. Okay. So <clears throat> it's a long story then as to what happened, you know, uh, how I came to go to Slain Studios, take the money that I was supposed to be paying back my mortgage and head off one rainy, wet morning with the mortgage money. And I remember my wife saying to me on the morning, where are you getting the money for this? Right. I said, I'm, I, the county council are going to have to wait for their money, I said, you know. And went on to Slane, to John D. in Slane. That was a fairly big step to be taken. Yeah, it was a huge step. Yeah. A huge step. And you know, at that time, I wouldn't have travelled any further than Tullamore okay. to the, do the shopping. Slane I didn't know it was a big, big, <laughs> big adventure for me in the car. And the car as well, you know, you didn't think it would get you that far. Yeah. But I do remember it well. And I remember going up and recording Brown Eyes. I never forget hearing the voice okay. for the first time. You heard yourself? Heard myself yeah. sing for the first time. Were you impressed with that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Oh, God, no, that thought. But I, I, I you know, I, you, I took it. You persevered with it, anyway. I persevered with yeah. it. But I, so I got this tape. I think there was three songs on it. And uh, Calypso was one of them, a John Denver song. Yes. And <clears throat> I hadn't even the words for it right. <laughs> I had it. I don't know what I sang. You wanted first, to get the job done. I no wanted to what. get the job done. Yeah. Fraulein was another one. Yeah. The old song, Fraulein. And Brown Eyes was the first one on it. Yeah. And that was a song that my mother always sang, you know. Okay. So that anyway, meant a lot I, to you then, yeah. Pardon? That meant a lot to you. Uh, it meant a lot to me. But when she'd ramble out to my house and with the kids, she'd always, Esther would always ask her to sing it. And, yeah. But it was always um, a song that she would have sang. I got into the car, headed back to Mullingar, to where the radio station was. Okay. 
very ambitious altogether, a pirate radio station. And he knew where it was anyway. And I stopped outside it. And um, he wouldn't get in at that time. But yeah. I waited and I waited. And I could hear Don at the other radio on in the car. And I could hear Don Allen on it. And didn't somebody come out? I think it was the fella that owned the place. Okay. And he left the door a little bit open. That was your That's opportunity. That's all I needed. And I went in. <laughs> and I remember Don Allen saying to me, what? How did you get in here? Right, you know, okay. and I just said, sure. Um, I came up with this CD, you know, or this tape, little bad tape, you know. I said, would you listen, would you have a listen to it, you know? Yeah. So he did. And I was going home, and I remember well where I was. I was between Ratchford Bridge and Terrell's Pass. Okay. And I heard myself on the radio. That quick? My God, that quick. Yeah. He liked what he heard and played. Man. And it was from there then that... It took off. That was the catalyst for... Well, that was it, the catalyst yeah. for for the start of it, you know what I mean? For yeah. the start of it for me. So I got out a few more, Bob, and made a few more songs, yeah. you know, that sort yeah. of way. But I didn't know where I was going or what I was doing because yeah. at the, at the, at the, the whole lot of it was I only wanted something simple. Mm -hmm. And this was getting a bit complicated for me, you know? Yeah, but you were getting a big vote of confidence for, for the huge, step you took. Huge, huge vote of confidence. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, you, you need to know what, you're, what you were going into, and I didn't, yeah. Yeah. you know? And it took me places that I wasn't sure yeah. of where, where, where it was going to go. Okay, you know? and now, now that you'd begun, say, with the radio play, uh, what point did then did you decide to quit the job and move into music? Well, that came, uh, I remember, it, you know, I, I met up with Jerry Walsh from the Mighty Havens and Brian Finley. Oh, yes. And they, were, they were the both of the people that were involved with me in the first place. And um, they, we'd done a deal, but just a deal that, we look after you, sort of mm -hmm. thing, you know, that sort of way. And I bring you down to Cha Nicholson studio in Antlone. And Paul Brewer was the engineer. Kevin Sheeran was the producer. Oh, yeah. And yeah, um, good hands there. Good hands. Good hands. Yeah. And I remember being fascinated by what was coming from the studio. And that's the first real recording I'd done. Okay. I'd done Brown Eyes, Calypso, and I Know That You Know. Foreign Love. Okay. There were four songs. And were you getting to like the, the voice of John Hogan a bit better? Well, it was, a, it was a little bit more. It was a little bit It was a little bit better. But I do know, I remember well Kevin Sheeran producing it, you know, and Kevin was so good and, and you know. Yeah. And he was me like that knew nothing about studios or music for that matter. Okay. And Kevin was playing a little bit on the guitar, you see, it, in the song. And I said, he stops, you know, and I said, why don't you keep playing, you know? But Kevin, being the diplomat that he was, said nothing for a few minutes. And then he said to me, it's not what I play, it's what I don't that makes all the difference. And I said to myself, that's a load of cod That doesn't you know? make much sense that to me. That doesn't make much yeah. sense to me. But anyway, to make long story short, he was right, and I could see it afterwards. Yeah. But that was the first introduction to, to, to um, real studio. And then they took it further. Yeah. You know, there was such a... Such a a response to Brown Eyes and all yeah. over the country yeah. that a band was formed. Right. You know, and it, oh my God. It then was, it was a new step of taking the band on the road. and Taking the band on the road. And then I had to make a decision whether to leave a job that was nine to five and very, you know, very reliable to go into something that I didn't know what, was, what I was going into. Mm -hmm. So I took the decision to, um, to go on the road. Okay. And I remember uh, leaving leaving the factory that day and leaving all the guys that I knew so well, worked with for so many years. Mm. And it, it, was, it was a very sentimental day, very, yeah. very, you know, it's one and of those a small days. party of saying, am I doing the right thing? Well, there was all of, all, all of me, but I never, you know, I never disbelieved that if it failed, I'd do something else yeah. and I'd survive. You, you had know. that confidence. I had that confidence, yeah. yeah. I really had that confidence. Yeah. And I knew I'd survive if I kept, yeah. kept this focus all the time. You and where, know? Was the, where was the first gig? Can you remember that one? I can remember the first gig. I think now there's, there's been different... Uh, it was in the Green Briar. Okay. In Oramore. Oramore. Oramore, yeah. yeah. The Green Briar was... A, a, it was flying at the time. It was on the, the old Dublin Road yes. now, as it were, you know. And uh, uh, Michael O'Brien had um, that song... Uh, your, what was it? He had a huge hit with the song. I can't Fale remember. Fail of White Lace, was it? Fail of White Lace. Yeah. And he was on that night. Okay. And we were launching the band that night as well. You can imagine, Gibby, you and I have been on the road for quite a number of years. Yeah. 
<laughs> and you'd be leaving it to the last minute you have to go to a gig now. Yeah, yeah. But at that time, the gig was starting at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. It was a longer time. affair, yeah. I was there at 4 o'clock in the day. Okay. So that'll tell you how innocent I was. Yeah. Sitting in the car park for yonks waiting for someone to come, you know. Yeah. And we, then we were on last, you know. And I had a white suit. I was at, you get, no, I tell you what, I, was, I had a white coat. <laughs> I was out there hiring it from Galvin's in Tullamore <laughs> and a red dicky book. You were trying to mind A red dicky book. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Oh, God, I remember that yeah. so well. Yeah. And, you know, I, I had to, a half a dozen songs or whatever. We were only doing half an hour, yeah. you know. But she was all new to me, you know, yeah. and I was, she and I didn't know. I couldn't believe the response. I never set out for fame or fortune. Okay. This was all, always about uh, trying to get a few bob for the kids, you know, to do things with the But I didn't want a fortune. Yeah. And I wanted to keep my life simple. Okay. And it was being, being complicated against, against, all, yeah. against my will type yeah, thing. Against you know, the grain, yeah. And against the grain, yeah. 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 And say that drive home that first night, like a man coming from a nine-to-five job and suddenly you're catapulted into the limelight. What, like, how did, that, how did that translate for you on the drive home? I'll tell you how it translated for me. Um, I remember the first night that... That night was okay. I came home and I didn't think much about it because... You were um, still on the high of the whole... Still on the high, yeah. yeah. But I remember the first real gig was in, I think it was in um, the Farnham Arms in Cavan. Oh, yes, yeah. And at that time on the Saturday nights at home, we would um, bat the kids and all the rest of it. The it was a real family routine. affair, a yeah. regular routine. And, and uh, I remember um, a guy picking me up that evening... Um, Maguire was his name, Pat Maguire. Yeah. He was playing he piano. He couldn't bad with a name like that. <laughs> <laughs> but he was picking me up at four o'clock in the day. Yeah. Four o'clock in the evening. And I remember going to Cavan. I didn't know how to get to Cavan. Right. You know, I, I just didn't go nowhere. And I remember feeling so sad driving away from the house. Yeah. And I said, this is not for me. This disrupts the whole flow. This is, this is not for me. But, Good. but it's been a long, um, you know, there's, 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 there's so much has, has happened. And at that time, yeah. you know, it was a whole different world out there at that time, you know. Yeah. There was, Mick Flavin was making a name as well. And um, Declan Ernie, uh, Paddy O'Brien, yeah. all those guys were around the same time. And Daniel was... Uh, he was the forerunner of us of the whole lot. He was he was the trailblazer then. He was the trailblazer yeah. at that time, yeah. And yeah. I remember all of that, you know. So we were all in the one pack, you know. Yeah. But for me, it was a baptism of fire. Ladies and gentlemen, performing a soundstage country exclusive, please welcome John Hogan. Oh, my darling, I love you. And all the little things you do Oh, be close, don't let go Our love will never fade, I know In the moonlight you were so pretty I fell in love and you're the one to blame I can't help but being drawn you to you Like a mind is drawn to a plane A love like ours will last our love will surely never die We will go through life together Walking onward side by side I love you and all the little things you do. Hold me close, don't let go. 
Our love will never fade, I know Our love will never fade, I know Okay, John, uh, you had the band on the road and you were doing some recording. Had you written any tracks yourself to be put well, on those albums or...? <clears throat> Give you, I'll tell you the first I'll tell you the story. Right? When I was in Borna Mona, I was a supervisor, shift supervisor. Uh -huh. So you were supposed to be keeping an eye on everybody, you know, but I, I used to sneak the guitar in <laughs> and play a few bits. <laughs> and I remember being in the store one night and I put a new set of strings in the guitar and um, I wrote the first song that night. While you were at work. While I was at work. <laughs> and I remember just to tell you a little story when I, when I, rem when I was leaving the manager, I said to him, I said, I don't know if you knew it, I said, but uh, um, I used to play a little bit of guitar in here now and again. Oh, he says, I knew you did. He <laughs> says, I knew. So somebody was squealing at me somewhere along the way. Maybe this is where the Marino uh, Walls came <laughs> for the board in the monad. <laughs> so the first song, the first song that I did, yeah, that's where. But the first song that I wrote was called Step, uh, My Feelings For You. Okay. And uh, yeah, I wrote that on board in the monad. And that was, uh, that was my first introduction to songwriting, you yeah. know. But, you know, I still never counted myself a songwriter. Yeah. I really didn't, and I, I'm waiting for the day that maybe I'd write something that, they say you never, you're never a songwriter, you write a classic, you know. Oh. I don't know if there's a classic in me, but having said that, I'm writing all the time. Uh -huh. I know that Foster and Alan have recorded songs of mine, you know, and um, there's a few more people have recorded songs of mine. So, you know, there was... The Candle of Mine, who has turned back the years. There's, there's, there's a million other songs out there at the minute, yeah. you know. I can't even remember maybe 40 or 50 songs that I've written. And, and the new album that I'm working on at the moment is, is a lot of my own stuff. Oh, well, good. Of, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of songs. That. And I mean, most of the stuff that's out at the minute is songs that I've written myself, you know. That's so I'm dabbling into more songwriting. And I suppose the way things are at the present time, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, it gives you more time to write, yeah. you know. And to, to well, it's, it's changed for everyone, really, hasn't it? <clears throat> it has indeed, Gabby, yeah. Um, but I wouldn't go there, yeah. as, you know, because I, I think um, I think there's too much negativity around, being fed negativ negativity yeah. all the time now. Yeah. And I think we have to be positive about everything, you yeah. know. And I think positivity in every field is hard to be positive sometimes, mm. and it's hard to be positive if you're unwell, it's hard to be positive in a lot of situations, but, but, still but I think those position. in charge of life um, yeah. need to feed a little posi positivity into all of us. It's know, a good position to take though. Uh, yeah, well it is, you know, and we can look at the glass half full most of the time, yeah. it's good, Yeah, it's good, you know, yeah. but it's not always easy to do that, but, yeah. it, but it is, it's important, yeah. yeah. I always look around me, um, you know, I always look around and at the things that I have rather than the things that I haven't. Yes. And I always yeah. say, I'm, I'm so grateful for what I have. Yeah. And I, I'm not saying this goody goody fella or anything like that. No, no. But I, you know, I see, for example, I see the rain the way it falls. Mm -hmm. I hear the birds the way they sing. Mm -hmm. I see the way the wind blows the trees. I see the stars at night and the moon, the mm -hmm. sun. I see those around me. I see the loveliness of the day. Yeah. I see being able to get up in the morning. And, and those things, are, are, they're, they're, you can't put a price on them. Well, a lot of people take it for granted and don't even appreciate it. Well, all I would, you know, what I'm going to say, that I, I would never be uh, uh, going to dictate to people or mm. say and do anything because um, everyone is their own self and they do their own thing. But I would always adopt one word uh, uh, in anyone's life. Mm -hmm. And I may suppose this present state of the way things are at the moment, I think people will come back to it anyway. It's simplicity. Yeah. If you keep your life simple yeah. in every way. I was listening to Van Morrison's, um, it was a quotation from him anyway, um, and I thought it was a negative uh, from someone who was, could influence people quite yes. a bit yes. because of his popularity. I thought, why would you say these things? Okay. You know, that sort of way, not that I would be um, qualified to judge the man, you know. No, but no, but having said that, what you heard. I, it prompted me to write a little piece of my own. Okay, you know? well, see, you might you might do that for us somewhere. Well, I I I, I have it with me, and at some stage, I will read it to you. Absolutely, it's a little, a We'd little love to hear that. Yeah. A little poem more than anything else, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. What 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 label was your were your first recording on, John? 
My first recording was on Kate Hill, okay. and a guy called John Buckley was, yes. and and, and um, the first album was with Kate Hill, and my first introduction to television was with Kate Through Hill, that. and it was, uh, of all things, to get was the Late Late Show. Oh, that was a bit of an honour, wasn't it? Well, it was an honour, and it was pretty scary. Let me tell you yeah. as well, because it was back in track. Yeah. To all I have to offer you is me. I remember it well, and I was, you know, I wasn't doing much at the time, you know, in yeah. terms of being on the road. And they got, I had a white suit. Well, if it wasn't altogether white. <laughs> Whitish. A whitish sort of a suit. <laughs> and I felt so out of place, like, with this whitish suit. And I had, uh, when I went up and they said, Sh -sh -sh them shoes won't go with that, you know. Sure, that would be typical of me. Like, I wouldn't yeah. have them. So they went off and bought me a pair of shoes. Okay. You know, so the wrong shoes. But anyway, and I remember my introduction that night to to Gay Bourne, but I was terrified because the backing track didn't come in until the last minute, you know what I mean? Okay. You didn't get much of a run with it. And you wouldn't have been accustomed to that No, I wouldn't setup. have been accustomed no. to it, no, no, no. I would probably be the worst. So it was all, all, all a big, a all a big learning curve? Then. Oh, it's all a big learning curve, but it was a yeah. great experience. You know? oh, yeah. And Gay was very, he was very good that night, God be with the man, and yeah. uh, very good to me. But I remember he said, Daniel O'Donnell, he says, Watch out, this man could threaten you, you know. <laughs> and there's no threat to him, let me tell you. That's a compliment. That was a compliment yeah, at that definitely. time. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. But, you know, from then, I think i I done a couple of albums with, with Kate Hill and, and um, Shea Hennessy took over Kate Hill then and yes. I done a um, couple of albums with them. Okay. And then I moved to Ritz Records. But know, that was so. a step up? Yep. Well, it was, uh, you know, I, I would never see anything as just there's another move in yes. in, in yeah. the career you know yeah. that sort of way I don't know if it was step in any direction but I was glad to be there as well the same as I was with Kate Hell yeah. but Daniel, you know? Daniel was with Ritz at that time wasn't it yeah but would open up a bigger well yeah I suppose they, they had a they had a huge audience that time they, yeah. they had a big 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 yeah. big setup at that time so uh, but I didn't take it that way you know yeah. I just was glad to be going in to record with them that's all um Mick Clerkin, the managing director, of, yeah. um, he suggested we go to Nashville. Okay. To record an album, you know, to record an album. And How did you feel about that? I was like a child put into a big toy shop. Okay. <laughs> At Christmas. <laughs> because, yeah, Christmas. <laughs> because this is going to be fascinating for me. Yeah. Imagine going to Nashville, like you were going to Nashville. Yeah. And sure, I'd never been that far anyway, but uh, I was delighted with myself. Thrilled, absolutely thrilled. So... Um, we had a bit, we had a bit of a job getting the visas and all the rest, you okay. know, to record. But we got them, and we headed off myself and John Ryan, Jerry Walsh, and Brian Finley. All the material had been sent over to a guy called Ronnie Light, okay, to record the album. And when I got there, I remember, I, you know, the, you know the way we brought a child the first time into a shop and be looking here and looking yeah. there. Yeah, and that was me, looking. Okay. everywhere to see what, yeah. what I could see, you know, yeah. that's what. And I remember getting out, we were after travelling for so many hours, but I got out and I had to go up along, you know, up the along strip. the street, you yeah. up along the strip looking for this one and All that one. All these famous names yeah. you'd heard of. And yeah, and yeah. I heard somebody singing in, in, in what was supposed to have been Hank Williams' house but they had taken his house from where it was originally and moved it into the strip. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know this. But anyway, I went in and there was nobody in there and himself singing. He was just singing. Wow. The barman on himself, that's all. There was nobody there, not a one. And I said to him, could I sing a song, you know? Yeah. And I took the you can hear me playing the guitar. I'm not a great guitar player. But I took the guitar and sang a song. And I just wanted for me to say I sang in Hank Williams' yeah. house. Could have been anyone's house as far as I know. Still a, a big experience. Though. It was a big experience for me, but he, was it his house? I don't know. You know, I think he could have, could have just told me that. <laughs> I, was, I was happy with it anyway. But, yeah. you know, to record then was, was fascinating. I remember going into the studio that morning to record, you know, and John yeah. Ryan was there. A guy called Ronnie Light was the producer. And uh, there was Hargis Pig Robbins. Oh, yeah. The, the blind piano player. Mm -hmm. He would have played with all the, yeah. the greats that time, you know. Uh, there was Milton Sledge, who was, who was a drummer uh, with uh, Garrett Brooks, who was just mm. beginning to emerge at that time. Um, there was Leo Jackson, Leo Jackson, the guitar player. And Leo, there was a fascinating thing that happened to me, and it stays with me, and it'll stay with me till I leave this earth. Mm -hmm. He was the guitar player with Jim Reeves, and um, I remember when they were doing the session, we yeah. were doing a session, and I, I remember Stepping Stone was on that session. 
But it, they'd all listen to their, they play it together, you know, and then they'd listen and they'd correct anything that would need in correction. But Ronnie Light said to, to Leo, he says, there's a noise in your guitar. Will you bring in a different one after lunch? And he said, I will. Mm-hmm. Now, at that time in Nashville, these guys that I was, all of the rest of them, to be honest with you, I couldn't keep up with the meeting. Okay. Because they had their breakfast and it was that size. And they, they don't had do their, small portions. They had the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't keep up with them. So I said, no, I, you're grand, go ahead for your lunch. You know, yeah. I said, I'll stay here. So I was, I was sitting there anyway. And Leo came in, Leo Jackson came in, and he put this guitar case in front of me, you know. Uh-huh. And I remember he said to me, John, man, take out that guitar. And I said, yeah, took out the guitar. Just took it out for him, you know. Yeah. So I took it out of the case anyway, and I remember looking at it. And he said, play, play a little bit on that, you know. And I said, not in front of you, I won't, you know. I said, you must be joking. No, he said, you play it. So I strummed a couple of chords that I knew anyway. And he looked at me, and he looked at me with a sort of a a sadness that I hadn't seen in him, you know. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you remember this now? You're the first guy, he says, to play Jim Ray's guitar since he died. And I was stuck to the floor. Yeah. I never, I will never forget it. And I I took the guitar up like this, and I turned it, and I said, did he sign it? And he said... And I, this is exactly what he said. He said, no, and I'm afraid some son of a bitch will steal it and sell it for 50 bucks. Yeah. And I said to him, Leo, will you sign it, you know? Yeah. And make sure they know it's Jim's guitar. And that was fascinating for me, you know, yeah. and fascinating for me to watch all of those people working together. Yeah. And how lovely and how simple they were. And a different process from different what, you, process what we from do home, or yeah, how, what process, you do. Yeah. Um, it was still daunting, but yeah. it, was, it was fascinating. It was yeah. Absolutely fascinating. And at that time, too, you know, I got the opportunity to go to... The photos were taken for the album were taken in the Ryman Auditorium. Oh, yeah, yeah. The old Ryman. Yeah. Uh, in front of that... The Mother Church, they call it, yeah. The Mother Church. Yeah. Mother Church of Country Music. Yeah where all the greats had performed over the years, you know. And I remember walking into it and feeling this. You could feel it like. You got, you got a vibe off yeah. of you. Yeah. And I remember the person that was showing it around because you had to get special permission to go in that time. Okay. There was, it wasn't open to the public at that time. It was closed okay. for whatever reasons at the time. And special permission to get your photo taken in front of the microphone that everybody sang from yes. at that time, you know. And I remember them showing me, there's only one room in this building at the time. And you can imagine Nashville, like, in the summer, you know, with yeah. 80 degrees of humidity and whatever, you know, it gets hot. <laughs> but <clears throat> he said only one room in the in the building with air conditioning, and that was the radio room, where the radio, where I went out from radio. Okay. And he said, that's where Hank Williams used to go in and sit while, it was, while he was waiting to go on, you know. Waiting for the call-up. Waiting up. for yeah. the call-up. Yeah. But I also got the opportunity then to go on the, the Grand Ole Opry, which was moved out of town at yeah. that time, you yeah. know, and... I was uh, I was fascinated with it, but I was backstage, okay. which was even more fascinating. You see yeah. the whole inner works of of the Grand Ole Opry. So slick. Oh, so slick! It's unbelievable. Yeah, and I was sitting with um, oh. Johnny Russell. Yeah. Johnny Russell, that's the man I was thinking. Of. But anyway, we're sitting with Johnny Russell backstage. Just, just uh, uh, you're actually on stage, yes. but you're not yeah. in camera shot or you're not in public play. And he was talking to me about, uh, you know, all the songs and all the singers and all the things that he'd done. And he said to me about, they're going to put me in the movies. He said, he recorded that. And he says, Buck Owens recorded it, he says. I recorded it, Buck Owens recorded it, he says. And uh, the Beatles recorded it. Well, the Beatles recorded it. The Beatles recorded it as well. And he said, the revenue commissioners recorded it and that finished that. (laughs) 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 But we were both talking anyway. And... You know, I was just, I was in awe, like, and I had bought a pair of boots, especially for the job, you know. Okay. A pair of uh, the real Western boots, yeah. you know. I felt, oh, I felt great, this, you know. <laughs> in How will these go in Kilbegan? Oh, <laughs> Kilbegan. <laughs> Far cry from Kilbegan, that was, yeah. you know. But um, I remember we were both sitting there, and this young lady started to sing anyway, and we both stopped, and everybody stopped. Okay. You know. Fascinated with the voice, you know what I mean? So I went over to her. When she was finished, you know, she was coming back and there was an entourage with her. Yeah. And I just said, that was something else. It was really good. I had to make a comment on it. Okay. 
you know, she asked me a little bit about where I was, where I come from, and I just said I came from Ireland, and it was only a couple of words. I said I'm over to record a couple of songs here, you know. And her name was Patty Loveless. Oh, yes, yes. And Patty went on to become very famous after. But when, Huge what impressed me about her was an hour after we were still sitting on the side of the stage watching all the different artists come and go and she was coming out with an entourage at the time, you know, and she walked over to me. Mm -hmm. She said, I wish you well with your recording. Lovely. And yeah. remembered my name. Yeah. I couldn't nearly hardly remember my yeah. own name. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe one day we'll get her on the sound stage and she'll tell oh, us about meeting John God, Hogan. I'm right, I'm right. <laughs> oh, it's great. It's great. But there's, you know, those are, those are memories. Great memories, great experience. Yeah. Great experience, yeah. great memories. Yeah, great memories. And that's her stepping stone. Uh, that song that but when I went to record Stepping Stone I remember uh, they had changed it from the way I had sent it to them you know okay. they changed the tempo of it that was what it was more. and you felt that changed the entire flow of the song it did it changed the entire flow of the song for the better okay for the better okay but I thought there'd be a huge response to it when I came home and there wasn't like nobody passed too much remark on it right and uh, <clears throat> I was disappointed obviously yeah I was yeah. disappointed yeah. with it you know I thought it would have created, I thought it should have created more of a buzz, but it didn't. I had a call from a guy called Harold Delore. Okay. And he says to me, I answered the phone, he says, Are you John Hogan? I said, yeah. <clears throat> he said, I'm looking for you for the past two years. And I said to him, what are you looking for me for? You know? <laughs> You're not a great detective. <laughs> I said, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not wanted for Anton, am I? <laughs> but anyway, he said to me, you wrote a song called Stepping Stone. I said, I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he says, um, it's a huge hit, he said, in, in a place called St. Lucia. Now, I had no idea where St. Lucia was. I could have been in Mullingar. Or something. And you're probably beginning to doubt if this and guy was, was for saying, real or not. I was saying, this is, this is a bit of a, you know, somebody's, <laughs> a wind up. Some, yeah, somebody's yeah. pulling my leg here somewhere. But anyway, he went on to say about it, it was such a hit over there, you know. Okay. So... He said, I'll, I'll fly to Dublin and I'll meet you <coughs> and I'll give you a deposit just to prove, you know what I mean? Right. And right enough, the man came to Dublin. And came he through. Gave, yeah, and he, he came and he gave me a deposit. It was a traveller's check. And anyway, so I said, I'll keep that now in case that hops all over the place. <laughs> but, but then he rang me about, about a, whatever, a couple of weeks after and he said, all is arranged now for you to come out. We, we arranged the time and everything else. And... Uh, you're going to St. Lucia? I'm going to St. Lucia. And would that have been a country, a country hotbed? <laughs> well, now, if you were, <coughs> if you were, um, you know, if you were in the Caribbean, yeah. what is the music in the Caribbean? It As would it was the reggae, yeah. Reggae. Yeah. Reggae, would, I would have all associated yeah. any part of that, you know, I, not that I knew where St. Lucia was, but Bob Marley stuff, you yeah. know what I mean? I'd yeah. say, yeah, what that one? <laughs> you know, and, and no, Stephen Stone wasn't going to be that way, you know. Yeah. But anyway... Um, he says, it's your song is, and I said, What's, what, what is this about? Yeah. But anyway, so we, we decided to go. I had the whole band with me. I had, I think, Tony Ford, and I had, um, yeah. I had Frank, Frank Downey, Frank Downey and yeah. Fiona Sir, uh, Johnny Doran, I think, was the drummer as well. Yeah. And those were some of them that were with me yeah. anyway. <clears throat> but we went up and we went to, they met us in New York. The St. Lucian people met us in New York, and we went there. And they were so good. We had a fascinating time. But the next morning we were uh, put on a plane for St. Lucia. And I remember over the antenna on the plane, they, yeah. they welcomed me on the plane and the band, you know. And I, I was listening. I said, it must be, <laughs> must be somebody else. It has to be somebody <laughs> Frank else. Frank Downey's not hiding <laughs> the maggot again. <laughs> but, but anyway, what happened anyway, we, we went on and they, they, were, they were ever so nice to us on the plane, yeah. you know. And they were treating us like, Royalty, like you okay. know, so, but we'll run with it anyway. We'll run with it. But <laughs> when you St. Lucia is a very small runway when you go into St. Lucia, very okay. small. So the plane is just a big jumbo that just goes in and it just barely comes up to the wire, stops okay. at the wire, you know. <laughs> but so I was watching this, looking out, and around the perimeter there was a whole lot of people. Okay. And I said to the boys, I said, Well, we came the wrong day, they're expecting somebody, you know, <laughs> some dignitary or other. Okay. You know. Well, when we got off the plane, it was incredible. Right. The army were there to mind us. There was police, there was cameras, there was people. This started to dawn on you then? That yeah, it was, it I didn't was... know, you see, that it was for me. I didn't know that. Okay. I didn't know the popularity of the song and I didn't know what it meant to them, you know. So, yeah, it was a fascinating thing. 
Absolutely. And how was it to perform to them then? Did they receive you well? Then? There was, I don't know how many was there. Um, they were the most fascinating people I had ever met. Okay. They were gracious, they were simple, they were caring, they were loving. They were so responsive. You it could have was, immersed yourself there very, very easily, could you? Well, no, because it was too warm. <laughs> 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 you, could, you could, but you know, uh, no, I, 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 I I loved it while I was there, but I was yeah. glad to get out of the heat. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't be used to that sort of heat. But no, they were wonderful people, and um, the response was enormous. Yeah. Radio, television, and we all, you know, when, when, when I got there, there was a chef had flown in from America. Okay. <coughs> at Cougar's dinner. <laughs> I mean, we were used to a bag of chips. In, <laughs> if you were lucky. <laughs> if you were lucky. And he was, you know, that, there was that sort of thing. And, you know, it was, it was remarkable. Yeah. And then they brought us to Shoney's, or not to, um, um, what was the name of that big holiday place out in, in, this big, huge holiday place. I just can't think of the name of it off the top of my head okay. now. But, um, and they gave us a villa. Not a, not, a, not a little room, but a villa each. Okay, each. A full villa, like each. E. Okay. All of these books were kind of villa. <laughs> I mean, far from villas, we were reared, like. <laughs> but it was wonderful. It was wonderful. To, yeah. A wonderful experience, yeah. wonderful to get, wonderful to see. Um, it was, and I've kept in touch. I wrote a song after for them called Love, Love, Love. Oh, yes, yes. Yep. Yeah. So my, um, Danny Sheeran, I think, was on that triple to this as well. Mm -hmm. But we wrote that song because it was... Um, my just way of saying thanks to them, you know. Because yep. I went through all the schools <clears throat> and all of the young children were all singing the song. Wow. In every school. They, were, they had their own dance to it. They sang it at mass. They sang it everywhere. They sang it around yep. the streets. And on Sunday morning, there was a massive country program on, on television, yep. on radio. And everybody, the whole of the the whole of the island of St. Lucia listened to country You music. couldn't but be impressed with that. No, but it was, and I mean, you'd expect reggae. Mm. It was total country. They knew George Jones, Hank Williams, and Merle Haggard. They knew all of that. Yeah. And then not only that, but they knew all the songs. So yeah, I actually saw a few people from St. Lucia actually making comments on your YouTube version of the Love Loves Of song, and they were absolutely thrilled that you would take the time to, to dedicate the song to them. Oh, yeah, but I, you know, they were, they were, as I say, gracious. Wonderful, yeah. simple people. And I've come back a few times, you know, but uh, I think I'm finished now. That type of personality sits well with you. Yeah, well, you know, I've built, as I said to you before, Gibby, I've built my life on simplicity and, and I, I'm hugely grateful for, for, for things. And, I, and I, I see, I always see good in mm. people. Yeah. No matter what. There's always good in people. A good approach. Yeah, it is, yes. The only way. Yeah. The only way, yeah. And then we'll take you to the mid-90s, John, and you scaled back the whole, the whole thing quite significantly. What, was, what prompted that decision, or was that your decision? Or No, I'll tell you what, how that came about, Gabby. Um, as you know now that technology now is mm. fantastic. Mm. I don't always agree with technology. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, I don't agree where it's bringing us in, in the world. I think it's bringing us the wrong direction. Yeah. And I think it has polluted so many minds and I think it still does, you know, yeah. and it's complicated our life rather than simplifies our life. Well, true. But that's my opinion of it, yeah. that's only my opinion of it. But I do know that when I was, when I started in the music industry and, and you, you would, I don't know if you're old enough to remember this, but, but the amps yeah, were, <laughs> when there was a band on stage and I was with these band, with the band, right, and they all had amps mm -hmm. and they were all up on things like that there yeah. and, and they were at ear level with them. So there'd be five, six people in the band. In a big crescent right amps, behind yeah. you, yeah. And we do a sound check, and I had only a little monitor, a little floor monitor to hear my own voice. But these guys and whoever would be, they do a sound check and it'd be grand. And then when they come out and the crowd would be there, they turn up these, and I could hear nothing. nothing you were fighting against it. Fighting against it. Yeah. And subsequently, uh, to make a long story really short, I, through not being able to hear over a band, mm. loud band with drums and everything else, Damaged the vocal cord. Okay. And I, it, it led me to so much hardship. And not a good position for a singer to find himself Not in. a good position to see. And I, I slowly watched, you know, I, I lost it. I thought it was my hearing, and I would have said it on several radio programs, my hearing, you know, that's gone. And, mm -hmm. But if you're not producing it in here, you won't hear it, you know no. what I mean? So. Yeah. But I searched the world. But after a couple of years, and I remember... 
Joe Finnegan was um, mm -hmm. on Shannon's side radio, and he, Still he, is, he yeah. rang Jerry Walsh and he said to him, Will you get that man into a studio? He says, If he only sings Three Blind Mice, what to do for now, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't sing Three Blind Mice at the time, you know? Yeah. And I was, I, was, I was devastated, you know? And I watched Chuck Owens was singing for me, right? Oh, yes. He yeah. was coming and doing most of the singing, and I was doing, trying to do little bits and bobs to keep the thing going. But I watched mm -hmm. it. It was ebbing away. Ebbing away. Yeah. Ebbing away. But after years, and it was nearly ebbed away at this stage, um, there was a guy that Jerry Walsh knew in, in RT, and he says, there's a girl called Chinna. And I remember her, her, her name because it's the Irish for fire. Okay. And uh, he says, she's up in Leopardstown. And I made an appointment. He gave me the number, and I made an appointment to see her. She's a voice trainer. Okay. Now, I had been with Tom Wilson up in in Dublin as well, and all the ahs and oohs and everything else, mm -hmm. I still didn't put the voice back. So anyway, this is so funny. <laughs> um, I went up to her, and she came scooting in on this little scooter, I remember it well. <laughs> and she said, uh, I said, that's a lovely little scooter, you know, because my me, me poor old dad had a Honda 50, and, yes. and I loved it, you know, and I had a Honda 50 myself right. for years. Pity you having it now. But <laughs> anyway, to make long story short, she says, I'm working with Bono, she says. Um, okay. The vice trainer for Bono, she says, and he bought me that for getting me in and out of the, in and out of the, 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 the what do you call it, you know, the studio where he worked. Yeah, anyway. yeah. But she, <coughs> she said to me, come on in here, so, and I went in, and it was a little small stool, and it was only about that height of the floor, you know, uh -huh. and she says, um, try to sing, I, I tried to sing, couldn't. She said, put your head on that. I said, sure, if I put my head on that, I'd be upside down. Yeah. She said, yeah, put your head down on that, you know. It was the first time in maybe three years, four years, I don't know what it was now, that I could sing. Wow. But I could only sing upside down. <laughs> Australia, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> that is fact. I could only sing upside down. Wow. But for me, after going through what I'd been through, to hear my voice upside down. Yeah. So that meant I was going to have to someone hang me That was me like out. the seas part. You out actually saw some out. light at the end of the tunnel. Like. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. you know, I don't know. And I said it, you know, that I can sing, you know. Mm. And, and I go around and I, I let my head down and trying to sing, you know. Mm. And it began to come back. But at that time, and you, you asked me the question originally as to how I downsized, began to... Mm -hmm. It came to a point where I couldn't pay the band. Yeah. It came to a point where the le Legion of Fans just... You know, people yeah. just uh, automatically, f mm. you know, they feathered out over over a period of time. No disrespect to any one no, of no, them. No, 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 no. But it was just they couldn't come up with the goods, and mm -hmm. they couldn't just come and keep coming. You know. So you're forced into the into the. <laughs> but I was decision. forced into yeah. that, yeah, because I I had I, I I had borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and borrowed, and mm. uh, I got to a stage where I couldn't borrow anymore to pay yeah. the band. So then that was time to move set back some direction. Reassess here. Back, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was a, a record shops, your New Road Records were called yes. at the time, and, and CD sales were huge everywhere. Mm -hmm. So record shops were booming at that time. And there was, a, New Road Records had several stores all over the place. Yeah. And so they approached me to do an album. Now, I really wasn't ready to do an album. The voice was only beginning to come back. It right. hadn't come back. So when they gave me an opportunity to do an album, and uh, so I went in and recorded the album in Paul Brewer's studio in Toronto. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're back with Paul again. And <clears throat> I remember going through this song, song, one song after another, and I never, ever was happy with it. Not one song. Not even one of them. Not one <laughs> of them. But I said, I do them, I do them anyway, you know, because I, I have to do them. I have yeah. to do it, you know, I have to do this. So what I did anyway was uh, I went in and Paul and myself worked together for months. Mm -hmm. And Paul would be saying, you can't sing, go home today, you know, go home, come back tomorrow. <laughs> and I come back in the next day and I'd have a go again and the same thing went on for quite a while. But, but anyway, we eventually finished the album. Mm -hmm. And this now is true. And Paul Brewer and a lot of the musicians that worked on the album would tell you the same story. Mm -hmm. And I remember I left the studio that time and I came down the stairs onto the church street in Tullamore. And I was so annoyed about this album, I said, this is terrible. Right. I don't want this album to come out. I really don't want this album to come out. But anyway, 
I stepped onto the street and told him more. This album was coming out anyway. There was nothing I was going to be able to do about it. Yeah. So um, I stepped onto the street and told him more. And there was a big black cloud coming over the the, <laughs> the bridge house. Not a great sign. Not a great sign. I said, oh, God. Anyway, and I stepped out. I was just walking about 10 steps down the street when there was an unmerciful clap of thunder and a flash of lightning. And it absolutely lifted me off to me. Oh, my God. And... I, I ran for cover anyway, and it's only the one, that's all there was, it was just the one clap of thunder, and I was expecting more, but there was no more. So I went on home, and I had a house phone that time, no thing, his mobile phone, yeah. and Paul Brewer was on the, on the, and he says, a bad news for you. And I said, what's that? And he says, lightning, he says, after wiping out everything we've done. <laughs> 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 I said, there is like a God. Like Marty McFly and Back to the <laughs> Future. <laughs> I said, there is a God. Yeah, that's great, you know. So we got to do it again. You got to do it again. Got to do it again. Were you a bit happier this time around? I wasn't really, no. <laughs> <laughs> when, is a, when is an album ever, an artist ever happy with a song, yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, always, I'm, always a, I'm always a critic of... And how was that received? Not, not how John well, Hogan we, perceived well, we, it, how, was the, how the audience take it? They didn't. They didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see it, if I see the album at home, I stop, 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 I go and take it out and put it back into a place where I won't find it, you know. It's probably one of the worst albums I've ever done, you know. Probably the worst album. Would you find yourself a, a major critic of your own work? I, I would be a major critic, yeah, I would be. But, you know, I am so grateful. Mm. I know what it's like not to be able to sing. Mm. I know what it's like to want to sing. Yeah. I know what it's like to hear a song you'd love to sing mm. and know you can sing and not be able to do it. I would have shed many the tear, many and many the tear during that time. Having experienced the high and then taken away from it. Well, me. it wasn't even, it wasn't about the high of being this or being that or being the other. Just the ability to do it. It was the ability yeah. to sing. Yeah. And as I say to you, and I reiterate this, my, my life has never been about fame or fortune. Mm -hmm. It's about simplicity. Yeah. But it was to be able to sing. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about being out there in front of millions or whatever, mm -hmm. but it was to sing with that guitar, just sing, sing yeah. the song. Yeah. And, you know, not to be able to do that was yeah. was 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 unbelievable. Yeah. But for me now, to be able to sing the way I am now, you appreciate I am that all. So grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing about it is, I can do things with the voice now, and I don't say this boastfully, but very gracefully and gratefully. I am so grateful to be able to sing now. Mm -hmm. So grateful to be able to sing, and I can sing better now than I ever did before. Great. Which is wonderful yeah. for me, wonderful yeah. for me. It's a great, um, you know, and you have to experience this. And you know when people say to me, and we're talking about singers, and we're saying, don't know if that fellow's a great singer or that one. I said, don't criticize anybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody's doing their best, you know, and yeah. everybody is doing their best, whether they're a musician or whether they're whatever, mm -hmm. you know, try and look at the good side. There's some know. positives in there somewhere. There's if you... always positives yeah. in there. That's yeah. my opinion yeah. anyway, you know. And if I can just take you to an RTE documentary where you said, um, and I quote, I regret it all. Do you want to talk about that um, phrase or well, does it still hold true for you? I still, no, I'll tell you what, at that time, I didn't regret it at the time because, mm -hmm. you know, if you look back on what we talked about there, mm -hmm. um, the voice at the time, what, there was a lot of things that was, um, there was a lot of complications with management, there was a lot of complications mm -hmm. with with. There were things that went on that I had no control over. Okay. There were things that went on that put me under so much pressure, which I was never, I never wanted to be there. Because again, I come back to where I wanted to be in life. Yeah. And where I am now in life. Simplicity itself. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I love the music. And at that time, I was in a bad place. I was in a bad place from the music, and as far as the music industry was concerned. Mm -hmm. I had been through quite a lot. Things that I couldn't talk about here, you yeah. know what I mean? I couldn't Just talk about a lot about of complexities. And there was a lot of complexities and there was a lot of things went on at that time. So I did say that. And I remember being questioned about it when I was doing the documentary with RT. But I said, yes, I, I, do, I do regret it. And I suppose looking back, I regretted the time it took me away from the house. Mm. 
the, the, yeah. the sacrifices that yeah. I made, I'm not yeah. saying that the sacrifices that were made at home as well, you know, yeah. but the sacrifices that, sacrifices that I made... You felt you I missed said, a lot, Tim. I, yeah, and yeah. I, I missed out on things, you know, and yeah. growing up kids and one thing and that. And say the phrase, like, I regret it all, do you think people misinterpreted that or took it... Yeah, it was, it, was, it was certainly... A, um, it was seen as not the thing to say, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but I would always say what I felt yeah. and what I feel... Uh, I would always want to be straight and honest, and honest. Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. and that's what I said at the time. Where I, where I, where I'm at, you know, when I went with Danny, then it was, it was still difficult, still difficult. You know what I mean? Still difficult, but because it was a, a a different type of thing we were doing, we were doing back and facts, and we yep. were playing live as well. But it was more difficult, and I found it tough for quite a number of years. Another adjustment. Another adjustment. Mm. Another adjustment. And then Danny left, and. Uh, Carmel and Stephen came in, and we we got on very well, and, and it was yep. going grand then, you know, until uh, COVID came along and, and stopped. Changed all it that. all for everyone. Changed it all for everyone. Yeah. 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 But I but but thankfully, and I say this, I'm writing more. I'm recording. I have 24 songs recorded at the present time. Well, John, it's great to have you in, and I'm delighted you could join us, and lovely to talk to you. And just before we wrap it up. Uh, You've had an amazing career spanning many years in the music industry. And I saw you talking to a young lad here who's on work experience in the studio. Um, what would you say to a young man like who's mad into music and what advice would you give him? Well, you know, you see, you look at everybody and their, their dreams and their, you know, and what do they want. And sometimes you say, do they really know what mm. they want? But we are supposed to be sort of the steering wheel for them, yeah, the guide. guide them, yeah, guide them yeah. along, you know, that sort of way. But I've always modelled, no, no, modelled my life. I've always, I've always, yeah, I suppose modelled my life on simplicity itself. Mm. And I would say to anybody, anybody with young children, anybody with teenagers, any, there's one word I would use, there's one word I would insist on them carrying with them through life. And I think it's the key to life, and that is simplicity. Mm -hmm. don't complicate your life in any way yeah. in any way no matter what you do in your whatever it is if you keep simplicity in your heart in your soul in yourself mm -hmm. I think you will move along through the world quite nicely you know but if you complicate it and God knows the creators of young people yeah. they're being bombarded with from complications all angles, yeah. from yeah. all angles yeah. and I have huge regard and respect Mm. for young people yeah. because they're, they're the key to the future. Absolutely. And they are getting a tough time of it now. Yeah. Yeah. But it, all I would say to any of them is keep it simple. Well, John, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show and hopefully we'll be able to do it all again at some stage. Thanks again. Yeah, uh, I'd be, I'm absolutely thrilled to have been given the opportunity to be with you and to tell the stories of uh, 33 years, that's what it is. But you know, I was... Uh, if I could get a little piece of paper, I know I left it somewhere with a, with a pair of glasses. Yeah, sure, yeah. And <clears throat> I was listening to radio the other morning and uh, it was, Van Morrison was giving out a little bit about, thank you so much, he was giving out a little bit about court and whatever and mm -hmm. I just thought it was a bit a bit negative and I, I sat down and I had to put on my glasses for this. Mm -hmm. so. Of course. But I wrote these few words uh, about the about the COVID, mm -hmm. right? about where we are in the world today with this yep. situation that we're in. And I, if you don't mind me reading Not it, at all. you now. We're delighted, thank you. And if I, can, if I can get it right, anyway. The world ain't like what it was just a short time ago. Something happened we could never imagine. How are we to know? What was coming down the tracks to crush and wreck the life we knew? Not seen, not known like this before by folks like me and you. It's not a dream, it is for real. Our very existence it can steal. It's going nowhere, it's here to stay. And we're reminded of it every day. We can't relax. We must stay sharp or we lose this battle from the start. It's on every news, on every phone. You should never think that it's you alone. We can't escape, that's what we're told. It targets both the young and old. But it will pass as night to day and our faith and strength will pave the way. We can turn the corner some fine day, but for now... We must learn to stay apart, but together this fight to win and from the shackles break free again. Our strength together will see us through and we can learn to live anew. That's, That's a beautiful piece. Ladies and gentlemen, John Hogan. Thank you so much. 
On behalf of myself, Gabby Maguire, and all the team here at Soundstage Country, thanks for watching. Well, I left my home one day for the sake of better pay in a foreign land, 12th century back in time, where the sun keep burning down on the whole hill in the ground, and I dream of that girl I left behind. Well, I signed on the dotted line And I thought in a few years' time I'd be home We could start a brand new life But everything went wrong I just didn't know how long They would make me stay in pain Or my crime I wish I was the rolling home, rolling home, home to the place I long to be. Oh, rolling home, rolling home. There's someone waiting there for me. There's the law that ruled this land That I just didn't understand I didn't know that I was doing wrong They don't seem to care They all do it when they're over there Here your face is justice of their God I wish I was the rolling home, rolling home, home to the place I long to be. Oh, rolling home, rolling home. There's someone waiting there for me. All the money that I save to pay for better days can make up for how I miss you so. There's no consolation prize when I close my eyes. I'm dreaming of you in our new home. I wish I was the rolling home, rolling home, home to the place I long to be. Oh, rolling home, rolling home. There's someone waiting there for me. I was rolling home, rolling home, home to the place I long to be. Oh, rolling home, rolling home. There's someone waiting there for me. Someone